The sun outputs 400 yotta joules of energy every second. That is, every second the sun outputs 800 times more energy than the entire world uses in a year. Now we can't capture all of that energy, not unless we want to build a Dyson sphere, and that seems particularly hard. But we do try to capture some of this energy here on Earth with solar panels. Solar panels, or photovoltaic cells, help to convert light from the sun into electrical energy for everyday life. But how does this work on a fundamental level? Let's discuss it. A photovoltaic cell is a system that when exposed to light will generate an electrical current. This effect has been known about since 1839 when a French physicist named Edmond Bercule made a circuit with some salt liquids, silver chloride and silver bromide and placed some electrodes in these liquids. When this system was exposed to light, he measured a small current, and thus photovoltaic cells were discovered. From here, it wasn't long until the first solid state cells were made. The first of which was made in 1884 by Charles Fritz. While these cells only had an efficiency of one or 2%, this was already a major accomplishment. So how does it work? When light comes into a solar cell, if it's not reflected, it is hopefully absorbed by an electron and it imparts enough energy to liberate that electron from the confines of an atom. Once the electron has escaped from the atom it was bonded to, it is free to move around the lattice of the material. Without any influence, this would result in some random movement of the electron, which would eventually find a new atom to call home. But if an electric field is applied to the material, then the electron moves towards the positive charge which can allow the electron to enter into the electrical circuit. This is the same as the electrode in the salt solution that Edmund Bocule used. The positive charged anode attracts negative charges like electrons, while the negatively charged cathode attracts positive charges. In modern devices, these electrodes are built into the device by engineering the material to have an excess positive and negative charges. Let's use silicon as an example because it's widely used to make solar panels. Silicon has four atoms that need to bond in its crystal lattice. To introduce charge to silicon, some of the atoms are changed with atoms that have a different number of electrons for bonding. This process is called doping and produces a material that has either negatively charged carriers, i.e. electrons, which is then called n-doped, or positively charged carriers which are electron holes, and this is called p-doped. For silicon, boron and phosphorus are commonly used for this process because these are the atoms that have a similar size to silicon and therefore don't introduce too much stress to the material. Boron has one less electron for bonding than silicon and is thus missing an electron, which leaves a hole where an electron should be and is p-doped. Likewise, Phosphorus has an additional electron and is n doped. This is an exclusive for boron and phosphorus. There are many other atoms that dope silicon. And there are many other crystals that can be doped. Silicon is just an extremely common one. Now if you take a piece of n doped silicon and bring it into contact with a piece of p doped silicon, these charge carriers move around and cross the barrier between the materials and this is called a PN junction. At the interface of a PN junction, an imbalance in the charges forms, which is called a depletion region. The depletion region generates the electric field between the two doped regions, and it is this electric field that allows the solar panel to work. Now, when the electron is liberated by the light, it will move towards the N-doped region, while the hole that was left by it will move towards the P-doped region. Now, by connecting the two sides with a wire, we can generate a current. When the liberated electron flows into the n-doped region, it will now begin to migrate along the wire to eventually return home to the p-doped region, and thus the current is produced. Now, this is the fundamentals of how to build a photovoltaic or solar cell, but how is the electron liberated and what limitations does this impose? When talking about a single atom, we can speak about binding energy, the amount of energy you need to give the electron for it to escape the atom. 
while in condensed matter it's similar, but a little different. For semiconductors, which is what solar cells are made out of, there is something called a band structure that contains a band gap. The band structure contains a valence band, which represents where holes are mobile, i.e. if a hole has this energy, it is free to move throughout the material. A conduction band, which is the same as the valence band, but for electrons. And a band gap, which is a region in between these two bands. In the absence of defects that have an energy that exists inside the band gap, to excite an electron so that we can extract the energy from the sun, the electron has to have enough energy to cross the band gap. In silicon, this is around 1.1 electron volts. And this imposes the limit for the efficiency of the solar cell. If we look at the spectrum of the sun after it has traveled through the atmosphere, it looks something like this. Well, 1.1 electron volts corresponds to a wavelength of around 1,110 nanometers. And thus anything below this energy can't be absorbed, which is around 19% of the total energy reaching Earth. Furthermore, Exciting an electron with more than 1.1 electron volts doesn't produce more current and thus the solar cells end up losing a lot of the energy from the higher energy light and corresponds to an additional 33% of energy lost for silicon. These two losses are the two largest factors for the loss of efficiency in solar cells and this can't be overcome for a single material. We can calculate the optimum band gap for the sun this is called the Shockley Quasar Limit and gives a band gap of around 1.3 electron volts. This is pretty close to silicon and has an efficiency of around 33%. There is a way to build solar cells that have a better efficiency than this limit and that is to use multiple different materials in a single device. The idea is that you can design the band gap of these materials to be sensitive to different wavelengths of light and thus more efficiently absorb the whole spectrum. These multi-layered devices have easily broken 40%, with some even reaching as high as 46% efficient. One problem is that this adds complexity to the fabrication and thus makes it expensive. In order to reduce costs, scientists have been looking at various materials other than silicon. Some of these materials, like perovskites, have the added advantage of that they are extremely easy to manufacture and may completely replace silicon as the dominant material of the solar cell. In either case, there has been significant progress in improving the sensitivity and cost of solar cells over the past decade. This improvement doesn't seem to have stopped yet, and most of the improvements haven't even been reached on the commercial market. As such, solar panels will continue to get more efficient and cheaper over the next decade, cementing them as a key and valuable energy resource. Thanks for watching, have fun, see you next time.